Coach, thanks for joining us. Hey, guys. All right. Uh, we'll go to questions. First up, we'll go uh, Tom Noy. <clears throat> Like how unique is this situation? Like you come off of such a huge win on Saturday and usually any other season, you might get maybe two or three non-conference home games to kind of build off that. But now you can just, you, you jump right into ACC play against Duke. Yeah, I, it's, um, it's amazing. You know, it looked crazy when we put it together. Of course, when I put the non-league schedule together, I didn't know my league dates yet. And then Paul Brazo threw us Duke, uh, Syracuse and Virginia. Uh, how about that one? And uh, but it, you know what? It, it's awesome. And and for our guys and certainly maybe it's a little more awesome coming off some success on Saturday that we're maybe a more confident group than we were after the Ohio State game. You know, so I, I'm very excited to see if we can build on Saturday. Uh, but, you know, again, great opportunity and you know, we said we wanted to play big games for these kids in the midst of a weird year with COVID and big games are all we have left, really, are big games. And I would include Howard because of what surrounds the Howard game. Next, we'll go to Patrick Engel. Like I know you've asked some of your, your lead guards to play big minutes and they've handled that really well. But what are you sensing from Prentice and Cormac just about the idea and, and maybe the chance for a little more rest uh, that, that would come into the equation if, if Trey's able to get eligible for Wednesday? Yeah, you know me, rest is overrated. You know, let me tell you, when I was at 1982, the year I was sitting out, Bob Talent was the coach. We used to scrimmage every third day. We would play three 20-minute halves. And I was on the blue team effectively because I was doing a year in residency. I would play all 60 minutes. And one day I did it, I forgot my shoes and I played in the grad assistant shoes. So, you know what, when you're especially guards like Cormac and, and uh, Prentice, those guys can play a lot. Having said all that, I look at Trey as another weapon for us more than a minute shaver um, because he's like Prentice and Cormac, he is a guard who has a feel for the game, is skilled, and as we've seen already in college, has the ability to score. We'll go to Tim Priester next. Mike, as, as you as I know, you're working on uh, Durham's uh, consistency. What what are your what are your points of emphasis with him? I mean, he's, I know he's gotten in foul trouble, and that's that's been a, a huge part of it, but what are you trying to emphasize with him as you move forward? I had him in here yesterday, Tim, and I just said, look, man, don't put the weight of the world on you. You know, I think it's the first summer that he really understood how to invest in his body and his game. And as you've seen, he's come back looking different. But that doesn't mean the returns happen immediately, especially with who we're playing. I mean, we're playing really good people with big guys with length, you know, and, and so he's not had maybe the advantage of a couple exhibition games, as Tom mentioned, maybe a couple non-league games where, you know, he gets into a rhythm. Uh, so, I, you know, I just told him, I said, just, just, just keep doing what you can do. And, and I think the biggest thing we talked to him about is no dumb fouls, you know, the reaches and the, and the hand and the post, because we need him on the court a little bit longer. Now I give him credit through a chopped up kind of game for him. He was there the last five minutes, you know, helping us doing things and his rotation to challenge that last shot was really a big play because Saar had knocked a couple of those down when he had a clean look earlier in the half. Darren Pritchett, go ahead. Mike, I'm going to start you with a little hockey analogy. Most hockey coaches would say the most dangerous lead's a two-goal lead. Do you keep going or do you pull back? I'm just wondering, when you're in the second half and your team's got a double-digit lead, how do you preach balancing still letting it rip offensively, but also at the same time wanting to run down as much clock as possible? Yeah, I think, I think you know, for us, and Scott Martin actually said it, and – I think overall, that's how we built the program, but especially this year with this team and maybe with the circumstances of COVID, 
and like we're going to be in let's rip let it rip mode all the time and you know scott said at halftime coach we can't back off and we really tried to go for it in the second half i, I think you have to give a lot of credit to kentucky's athletic defense i thought their young kids played really hard in the second half and i think John Calipari is going to build on that moving forward, you know, and they dug into us. So it was hard for us to now at the end of the game, those last couple of possessions, we were trying to burn that shot clock, that game clock down. And actually that last possession, even though we only got a, a step back three from Prentice and it was an air ball, there was only 11 seconds left in the game and we still had a foul to give. And so our ability or our standard of playing without fouling, which we've done pretty well here. We didn't do it well against Ohio State, obviously, but you, you had a foul to give, and now they got to take it out of si side, out of bounds. And so, you know, not till the end did we want to shake. I, I just think we got to keep playing and going for it. And and as long as we take good good shots, I, I think that's that's the area of growth I've liked since the Michigan State game. Um, I don't think we took uh, we took too many bad shots in East Lansing. And we paid for it dearly. Go back to Tom Noy. Mike, you've talked in the past about when it comes to playing ranked teams or playing teams that are above you in the standings. You've you've said, you know, maybe maybe there have been times the last couple of years you haven't been in a position to get something like that. Does does what happened on Saturday put you in in a better position to to maybe do something on Wednesday against Duke? You know, I think so, Tom, because that's the you know you heard my tone after Ohio State for and you know the juniors and seniors for as much as you've come off the mat and you've trended back up after finishing 15th as freshmen and sophomores we had not gotten one of these on paper where hey well they're above us and I don't know you know we're the under whatever and and I certainly you know even though Kentucky is going through their stuff that was the first time and I told them that after the game, and I, and I told them that was the challenge after the Ohio State game. Now it moves into, well, how do you use Saturday to be a little greedy and flush being told, hey, great win, and we certainly have not arrived. How do you be a little greedy? And, and God, you know, to beat a Kentucky and a Duke in the span of five or six days, I think would really jump up our confidence. Go next to Mark School. Hey, Coach. Uh, just curious, what's the uh, timeline for Robbie Carmody's uh, comeback? And then when do you think you will hear specifically when Wurtz would be eligible to be playing again? You know, with Robbie, I'm so encouraged. And I don't know if you've noticed that in the games, he's really lean. He's lost 20 pounds. And he got heavy after the fracture of the kneecap. And, and rightfully so. He wasn't able to work out or exercise. And he's still not able to run and really burn a lot of calories, but he completely changed his diet. And he's down 20 pounds. He, he looks great. He's not on crutches anymore. I would think, you know, mid-January, could Robbie Carmody be loose playing, you know, some uh, five on five for us and, and in, in live action and practice? And then you evaluate if you can use them in a game, you know, maybe near the end of January. Uh, as far as Trey, uh, you've heard me say, I applaud the NSA council for taking this issue up tomorrow. I don't know what the timing of their meeting is and uh, probably good we play at nine o'clock, right? Because if they're in a heated debate and, and a verdict comes down at uh, 8 p.m., uh, we're still okay. We, have, we haven't tipped. Um, and, and I know there's momentum for this rule, and I think you saw the women have really, women's basketball have really embraced it. I think it's taken some time because they've looked across all sports, being able to have their transfers eligible, so there's enough depth. I just applaud them for taking the issue up, and I, I hope the momentum that we've had the last week, and I have no inside info, but the momentum I'm hearing is, is that it's pretty good, and the odds are good. Go to Tim Priester. Mike, based upon uh, what Matt Zona gave you in the first half, do you see his his playing time expanding a little bit? And kind of like I asked about uh, Durham, what are your points of emphasis with Zona when he's in the game? Yeah, Tim, I really liked what he gave us against Ohio State, too. You know, in those short bursts, he knows who he is. 
He rebounds, sticks his nose in there, screens for people, keeps it simple. And there's a toughness about him. And he's not afraid of the big moments. You know, we've thr- Ohio State game, Kentucky game, you know, he's just battling. And so it does give us another frontline body for Jawan or Nate that I think we got to continue to keep developing. And I know I'm very confident in him after seeing what he did in short minutes against Ohio State and Kentucky. I know we're confident in him. Go to Darren Pritchett. Hey, Mike, it looks like Duke right now, like Kentucky's trying to blend that young talent with the veteran talent right now, early on in the season. As you look at Duke right now, I'm wondering what you see offensively early on in this season. Well, you know, it's similar. It's similar in that the Kentucky, a lot of young kids and SAR and a lot of young kids. Uh, they have a, a Duke has a lot of youth, but they also have a couple of veterans who've been there. And, and uh, the difference in the youth is their skill level and, and you know, they're, they're a little more skilled in their ability to shoot it and score it. Kentucky was still trying to find themselves on the offensive end, I think. They certainly found themselves defensively in the second half against us, in my opinion, when they come out and get on you. That's like, that was like Florida State bodies coming out and mauling you. Uh, and I don't mean fouling, just making the court seem small. Um, so a so, little, more, little more skill level, ability to put numbers on the board. I think they will really come out and pressure us and pick us up full court and try and wear our perimeter guys out. Um, but they, they have the ability to shoot it and score it probably more than Kentucky. Final question. We'll go to Tom Noy. Mike, just two things on, on Trey. If you hear at eight o'clock tomorrow night that, that the waiver goes through, you're operating under the assumption that he can play uh, Correct. tomorrow night? Correct. Our, our assumption would be that he would play. Uh, my goal yesterday and today was to get him in a white shirt more. And we've been doing that a little bit anyways the last two weeks because we felt this it was trending in the right direction. Uh, again, the finality will be sometime tomorrow, but uh, he's been in a white shirt yesterday. We'll get him back in a white shirt. It's a heck of a first game to throw a guy into if that's where we're at. Uh, but I told him to be mentally ready to play uh, tomorrow night. And then what has he shown on the practice court that you've, you've seen and said, man, if we could just tap into that this year, we'd be a better team. You know, the, the, um, the, and, you know, the, the all round guard play of a feel for the game guard, which just fits so great for how we play. And we've had so many of them through the years, but Prentice like Cormac, right? Like can put it on the floor, make plays off a ball screen, can make plays off the dribble, he has good size. He's 6'5". He is not super athletic, but he's a good athlete, and he can make shot. He can score it. He can shoot it. And, you know, he's a double-figure scorer in Division One. I. I don't care what league you play in. If you're scoring double figures and you're getting there at a pretty good, efficient rate, which he did uh, out in Santa Clara, it just, you know, and he's older and, and been in some games. So, um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm just – hopeful because when I look at our group and I see a, a Jogo and a, and a Wurtz coming off, those are two veteran guys coming off that know how to play. And then Zona, you know, we'll keep bringing along. Thank you very much, Coach. Thanks, I guys. See you tomorrow. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. We will see you all tomorrow.